his investigative work on the arrest and detention of Bradley Manning. He's the author of the new book, With Liberty and Justice for Some, How the Law is Used to Destroy Equality and Protect the Powerful. Glenn Greenwald, it is good to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. You will be speaking at Occupy Oakland. That is true. This afternoon, I'm very excited by that. And this, we're we're speaking on Thursday. Oh, that's uh, true. That's true. <laughs> so it'll be so the day before. I will have by the spoken. time you get there. Exactly. By the time we play this, what are you gonna say? You know, honestly, I'm I'm not entirely sure because I want to go down there and get a sense for what's happening and what the mood is and and who's there. But what I do know is that. For me, the what has happened with the Occupy protest movement is easily the most exciting and inspiring um, thing to happen in American politics in many years, certainly including and, and, and surpassing easily the 2008 presidential election. Um, I consider everybody who's participating in this movement, and especially at Occupy Oakland, where there's been lots of uh, tumultuous uh, activity, to be genuinely heroic. And, and so I'm really just honored to be there and excited by it. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you say it surpassed sort of the energy and the movement of the 2008 election. Do you see a connection there uh, of the people that were backing I do. and supporting the presidential can- candidacy at the time of, of Obama? I do. I You know, one of the interesting things in looking back in retrospect at the Obama candidacy that for me at least is so disillusioning and, and even angering is that Barack Obama specifically and deliberately targeted people who had become extremely cynical in the political process and had decided either that it wasn't worth doing at all or that they had done it before and they no longer wanted to. Um, and he talked about this corrosive cynicism in the citizenry, this perception that working within the political process changes nothing. And he specifically tried to persuade those people that it would be worthwhile to get behind his candidacy and that's what all this yes we can and and the audacity of hope was designed to convey and huge numbers of people young people and first-time voters and people who had become disillusioned were persuaded by that and poured their limited time and energy and money and resources into this candidacy and perceived that this was going to be finally the vehicle to re-empower the people of the United States in terms of our government. And, of course, none of that happened. And yeah. and, and, and the disillusionment, I think, was so extreme. Um, ironically, he kind of increased the cynicism and the citizenry more than anyone else could have. Um, and I think a lot of it is getting channeled into this Occupy movement that's grounded in the belief, the correct belief, I believe, um, that political change can't be effectuated through the political system. It has to be done by citizen anger and unrest and disruption outside of it. Oftentimes we compare what's happening now to the 1930s. Uh, if you talk about the New Deal, the New Deal came because of a grassroots movement and also labor movement uh, during that time. Do, do you think, I guess it'll be interesting to see how the White House responds to this, if it'll be moved or not. I think we've seen already what the White House is thinking about in terms of this movement, and I find it somewhat laughable because it's never going to work. But what they're trying to do, and they've made it clear, is essentially they want to co-opt the movement to reinvigorate the energy that the Obama re-election campaign is so obviously lacking and have it be the force that basically drove him into the White House in the first place. And um, organs, Democratic Party organs like the Center for American Progress have openly spoken about the effort to transform this movement into one that is about electing Democratic leaders and, and reelecting the president. Um, and I think that the reason why that's never going to work is because if the people who were out protesting wanted to work for the Democratic Party, there wouldn't have been a protest movement in the first place. Um, and I also think that people are able to see quite clearly that despite the rhetoric that we're now going to hear, the populist rhetoric from President Obama, that during his first three years in office, he's been far more devoted to the people who have funded his campaign, which is Wall Street and the banking and securities industry, than he has to ordinary Americans whose interests have largely been ignored. So how do you think this Wall Street movement then becomes successful? I mean, obviously, it, and a lot of people will say it's already been successful. Right. Ha- you know, it's changed the debate. Right. It's brought visibility uh, to the streets. Anything else, though? Well, I mean, I think the way in which it's already been successful is a critically important 
development, which is that it has injected discussions of income and wealth inequality into mainstream American discourse. Um, a watershed moment for me was sort of I was watching CNN um, a couple weeks ago, and, and there was David Gergen, who's sort of the voice of the yeah. political establishment, um, and he said something along the lines of, well, I, I think we need to acknowledge that income inequality is an issue worthy of some attention, which for him is uh, a very radical acknowledgement that is directly the byproduct of the Occupy movement instead of only talking talking about austerity and where to cut budgets. We're now talking about wealth inequality and unfairness. Um, but I think the more, and, and it's very difficult for me to answer your question specifically in terms of what's going to, what the outcome will be, because we don't, none of us know, right? It's, it's, it's an, it's the incipient stages. Part of what makes it exciting is that it's organic and, and relatively unplanned and unstructured. And so it can go anywhere, good or bad. Um, but I think that the more important, um, outcome that it's achieving, uh, that it has already begun to achieve and will continue to achieve, is that it is putting fear into the hearts of those who exercise power, political and financial power. And for me, if you look at the reason why our elite class has been able to run rampant over the last, say, decade or, or more, it's because this fear has been so glaringly absent. Um, if people who wield power can wield it without any fear of the repercussions, we've removed from the threat that they face the idea that if they break the law, they'll be punished um, because we don't punish political and financial financial elites, except with very rare exception. We shield them from the consequences of their crime. And so if you don't have a citizenry that's willing to march in the street and disrupt things and engage in, in unrest um, when they cross lines so egregiously, uh, then they will be without the the supreme limit, the most important limit, which is fear of the citizenry and how it will react to this degree of corruption and, and impropriety. And I think that's being reinstituted in a very important way. And that I see is vitally critical. Well, on that note, in, in that spirit, thinking of the general strike that happened on Wednesday in Oakland, largely peaceful. I mean, you had tens of thousands of people out there, and you didn't have no police anywhere, and you didn't need them. I mean, that part was amazing. But when you did go by Wells Fargo and a few other banks, there were broken windows and vandalism. Is that part of the fear that you're talking about? I think so. Um, and yeah, the guy, I guess, can that be included as part of that? I, I sh- certainly. I mean, you know, if you look at What has happened in other countries that actually face less severe income inequality and economic disruption than the United States has faced, including some Western European countries, what you see is fairly threatening unrest and even riots. Um, And policy planners in the United States and people... Uh, in positions on, in law enforcement and, and elsewhere um, have been aware for quite some time that if you start eroding the middle class and destroying people's economic security, history teaches pretty clearly that nothing triggers backlash and societal unrest and disruption and even riots more inevitably than that. And so there's a, a certainly a, an expectation that at some point this is going to happen. I think that's what part of the, the police coordination and, and excessive use of force is about is a way of deterring further uh, acts of protest. And so certainly, um, if you are somebody who's very wealthy and, and who is content with the status quo, um, anything that threatens it is something that you're going to fear. Um, and so I don't necessarily condone the use of violence or throwing rocks through windows and the like, um, but I think that that is an inevitable part of the kind of pilfering and plundering that has taken place, and on some level, there are good outcomes from it. And it has an effect. Um, and, and again, when we hear the description of what happened with the vandalism, I think people flippantly say anarchists. And, and I know a number of anarchists are like, "Well, wait a minute, no, we're you know we're not violent. It's a political philosophy uh, that we are about." But it does have an effect. Well, well, well just... I mean, if, you know, the thing is, it's, if, if you look at what has happened in the last decade in the United States, I mean, think about the kind of crimes that we've seen by the most powerful people. So we've seen the construction of a worldwide torture regime, spying on American people without the warrants required by the criminal law, an aggressive attack on another country that killed at least 100,000 innocent people, multiple acts of obstruction of justice, systematic fraud on an enormous scale that triggered a worldwide economic crisis that destroyed the economic uh, comfort and, and middle class security of tens of millions of people, mortgage fraud where homes are taken without legal entitlements. And every single one of these crimes has been completely protected. None have been investigated meaningfully, let alone prosecuted. And at the very same time that we've committed, we've created this template of elite immunity, we have created the world's largest penal state, prison state in the entire world. We imprison ordinary Americans at a faster rate at a, with, with less uh, mercy and, and forgiveness and leniency than any Western country 
country on the earth. People go to prison for um, infractions that in every Western country are considered too trivial to warrant imprisonment and incarceration. And so people are extremely well aware of this vastly disparate treatment that people who are powerful and in positions of privilege and, and, and prestige receive versus how ordinary Americans receive treatment before the, the bar of justice. And we're inculcated with the idea that we're all supposed to be equal before the law. And so when you see the very same people who, through their fraud and theft, collapse the world economy, profit and and, and prospering, or war, war criminals who are out selling books and, and making money instead of inside of a courtroom, the anger is going to be very real and it's going to be severe and intense. And when it's compounded by economic anxiety, of course some people are going to throw rocks through windows. It's, it's amazing to me that we haven't seen more of that um, and, and, and that more widespread yet. And, and the outrage of people throwing some rocks through the windows, breaking windows, and and what has happened to people who have ruined the financial. Yeah, system. it reminds me, you know, it reminds me a lot. I remember the the remember the incident when George Bush visited Iraq in 2007, and a journalist, an Iraqi journalist, threw a shoe at him, and this provoked all kinds of intense outrage by the American punditocracy and the media class and political elites, and demand we we forced the Maliki government to prosecute and imprison him. Um, Cathartic for others. Yeah, exactly. And 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 he became a hero in the in the Arab world. Um, and so here was all this extreme outrage at somebody who had committed a basically a symbolic offense um, and and yet uh, the person whom he was um, targeting with his shoes um, is somebody who has extreme amounts of blood on his hands and who has suffered no recriminations or penalties of, of any kind and I think you're exactly right all this outrage over people throwing a couple bricks or rocks through windows um, is 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 intense when measured against the almost apathy that we have in our political class um, toward people who have devastated the lives of, of tens of millions of people with their warmongering and their illegal uh, surveillance and torture, and especially with their financial fraud. Again, we are in conversation with Glenn Greenwald, author of the new book, With Liberty and Justice for Some, How the Laws Used to Destroy Equality and Protect the Powerful. And this is what your book really goes into, is how we got here. Major right. question: How did we get there? <laughs> right. Well, what's what's interesting is if you, if you look at the history of the United States, it was really founded in this conception that the rule of law had to be supreme. We learn through all kinds of cliches that this is the case: that justice is blind, that we're all equal before the law. John Adams taught we only have two choices: we can be a nation of men, meaning let them make decisions without constraints, or a nation of law. Those are the only two choices. Um, Thomas Paine said. To he who asks, where is the king in America, let a crown be placed on the head of law and declare that in America law is the monarch. And, and of course, the founders violated those principles in all sorts of violent and heinous ways that are too right. obvious to merit lots of discussion. But the important point um, is that they nonetheless uh, affirmed the supremacy, the sacredness of this principle, even when they were violating it. And that principle became kind of a governing aspirational principle that animated American progress over the next 200 years. And what we've really now done, beginning with with, I think, the Ford pardon of Nixon, um, and then it became a precedent that was set, um, is that we've explicitly repudiated this principle. We don't even pretend to believe it any longer. Now we make arguments. We, in the opinion-making elite class anyway, do um, that. Which you call uh, elite immunity. Right, elite immunity that when somebody is sufficiently powerful and society is sufficiently dependent upon them, they are instrumental in the functioning of the country, um, that it is not just in their interest, but in all of our, all of our interest, in the common good, to decide that when they get caught committing crimes, they will not be subjected to investigation and prosecution on equal terms with other Americans. We saw that with, with Richard Nixon, who got caught committing crimes and around Contra criminals, um, the crimes of the Bush era, the Wall Street crimes, and, and it's really the, this prevailing mentality now, this set of rhetorical justifications that enables the most powerful people in the society to commit law, law, commit crimes with absolute impunity. Is this something that has consciously occurred or just has happened over over the years? Well, I think what happened was if you go and look at the way in which Gerald Ford, who of course was chosen by Richard Nixon precisely to do this, um, went on television and justified to what was really an angry and, and, and highly resentful nation, the idea that uh, this politician who built his career as the law and order candidate, Richard Nixon, um, was going to be completely immunized and never see the inside of a courtroom, let alone a, a prison. Um, he went on the air, Gerald Ford did, and tried to explain why he was doing it and why he thought 
it was just. And what he said at the time was, um, well, of course I believe in the rule of law, the idea that law is a is is no respecter of persons, um, which is the crux of this this concept. Um, but then he he then went on and added this this newly concocted amendment designed to gut the principle that he just pretended to believe in, and he said. But the law is a respecter of reality, meaning that if there's too much disruption or if there's too much divisiveness that comes from prosecuting powerful people, if it's just too inconvenient for us to do it, um, then we can and should decide in the interest of the nation that we simply are going to move beyond what had happened and forget about it and, in a sense, sweep it under the rug and not bring about accountability for it. And if this were a leniency that were available to everybody, to ordinary Americans and, and the powerful alike, then you could have debates about whether or not that was a smart thing to do, but it wouldn't be a complete of evisceration of the rule of law. It's the fact that this is available only to people who are powerful, and this is the rationale. That sort of set the precedent. Lots of even well-intentioned people believe that, yeah, Richard Nixon shouldn't have been held accountable. It was time to pardon him because the country needed to heal. But whatever you feel about that specific case, the application of that that mindset, the problem is, is that, like so many things, once you endorse it in a specific case, it becomes normalized, and it grows beyond its original application, and that's exactly what has happened. The the law is a respecter of reality. Is that's that what that's what Joe Ford said. Yes. Yeah. And and I mean, which is really another way of saying, if I, a political leader, decide that it is um, uh, that it is inadvisable to hold somebody accountable under law, then they should not be held accountable. They should be shielded. And that is really another way of saying we are not a nation under law. We are a nation of of men, of of political leaders who, in their own discretion, can decide when the law does and does not apply. And that's exactly what the founders warned against. It's what the Constitution was most intended to avoid. And getting back to the founders and of course you got to keep in mind and, and you alluded to this slavery and uh, the disenfranchisement of women and, and na- white native. property owners and native americans etc cetera, etc cetera. right <laughs> <laughs> um yet they meant for the law to be one place where at least when it comes to economic realities that's the one spot not not that they believed in an egalitarian society but as the one s- under the law was the one place where people who were seen as people let's say that way um were supposed to be treated equal precisely i mean the founders were not just um, people who accepted, but who believed in vigorously the virtues of wealth inequality and income inequality and inequality and power, which isn't surprising since they were the elite of the society. They were very wealthy by and large. And so they believed that these, 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 uh, what, the, these fortunes they had amassed and their position in society was justifiable and earned. But what they emphasized was that these outcome inequalities, that some people are rich and most people are poor, would be acceptable and legitimate only if we all start at the same starting point with the same set of rules governing all of us, which was what what law was meant to be. And and you can sort of, I I analogize it frequently to a running race so that if you have, say, sprinters who are running a 100-meter race and everybody starts at the same starting point and everyone has the same rules, you can't elbow the other runners out of the way, you can't invade people's lanes, you have arm's length relationship with the judges and umpires, you're not bribing them in order to rule in your favor, then whoever crosses the finish line first, we accept as the winner, they get rewards, they we all accept that as legitimate. Whoever comes in second is second. Whoever comes in last is slowest. Um, you know, it's sort of like when Steve Jobs dies with $8 billion, very few people begrudge that, even though there's mass joblessness and homelessness and foreclosures, because there's a perception, rightly or wrongly, that it was earned, that it was right. justifiable. It's when someone gets to start at a starting point far ahead of everybody else, and when the judges are in their back pocket because they're being bribed and they're allowed to elbow people out of the way, then when they win, there's a, a rejection of the legitimacy of that outcome, and I think that's very much what's happening in American society now. Americans, by and large, don't mind income inequality. We've been inculcated to accept it as virtuous and and just. What people are really angry about, in my view, um, is not inequality in and of itself, but it's the illegitimacy of that inequality, the sense that the people who are winning are not winning because they deserve it, but because they're cheating. They are protecting their ill-gotten gains, using their power over our political and legal institutions. And and that's what I think is is, is sparking so much um, disgust with with our prevailing political culture. So, so far, we have talked about sort of this immunity for the political class. 
when did this move to the private sector? Well, that's that's one of the more disturbing aspects of it. That's a great question. I mean, for me, what what really made me realize that it was no longer just available to pr- public sector elites, but private sector ones as well, was the battle that was waged, and, and I worked on this for a long time, um, over the effort to immunize the nation's telecom giants um, from being sued by their customers um, and being prosecuted uh, for having violated a whole series of laws that prohibited telecoms from allowing government spying on the communications of their clients without warrants required by the law. NSA program of yeah, 2005. The NSA program. I mean, AT&T and Verizon and Sprint, the reason why the Bush officials were able to break the law and spy on Americans without warrants is because AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and most of the other industry leaders turned over huge amounts of documents showing the communications of their customers as well as gave direct access in some cases to those communications even though the law required that there be warrants first and and they had no warrants. Um, And the Congress specifically enacted these statutes that said that if you, the telecom industry, violate these laws... Because the the abuses that led to the reforms of the 1970 from the Church Committee that discovered decades of eavesdropping abuses on Martin Luther King and others, it wasn't just government officials. It was Western Union turning over telegraphs to to the government, all telegraphs sent in the United States to J. Edgar Hoover. It was AT&T allowing the government to listen in on calls. And so the Congress specifically passed laws that said that you, the telecom industry, are barred from allowing government spying on your customers' communications without the, the warrants required by law. AT&T and the rest of them did that. They got sued by their their clients, by their customers, um, in a whole variety of lawsuits, which were centered here in San Francisco. They the began a frontier foundation. Exactly. The EFF, the Outstanding Civil Liberties and Privacy Organization, uh, represented those plaintiffs. Um, and they began winning. The federal court started saying that if the telecom industry did what it is alleged to have done, it is clearly illegal. Um, and instead of doing what everyone else does when they get sued in court and begin losing, which is think about how to settle the case or continue to contest it, the telecom industry hired an army of bipartisan lobbyists, ex-officials in both parties, who went to Congress and demanded that Congress pass a law that had no purpose other than to retroactively immunize the telecom industry to say that they cannot be held accountable in court, that lawsuits must terminate an extraordinarily radical step to do, a a radical expression of lawlessness, Um, so much so that when it was first demanded, I was very skeptical about the fact that the Democratic Congress would do it, not because I had faith in the Democrats, but because I just thought it was too glaringly sleazy and corrupt, um, even for our political class to, to be able to do it. And yet six months later, with the leadership of both parties behind it, including the current president, the then Senator Obama, um, the Congress did exactly that. It, it enacted this legislation that terminated all, all lawsuits against the telecoms and, and shielded them completely from the consequences of their illegal acts. So here was a case where that rationale that I described your old Ford promulgating, um, the idea that, oh, we need the telecoms for our national security. It's unfair to subject them to these high le- damages awards um, seeped into the private sector and, and led to full-scale immunity for them. So could you draw a line to these telecommunication companies to then the CEOs of the major financial institutions uh, in the 2007-2008 crash? Absolutely. And And if you look at what is said about the reasons why banking executives and Wall Street firms and credit agencies um, are not being, and in the opinion of some, should not be subjected to prosecution, what you will hear is exactly the same mentality, which is it's more important that we recover economically than it is that we dig in the past and assign blame or point fingers, all those cliches, um, or that we need these firms for our economic recovery, and if we start subjecting them to prosecution, um, it's going to disrupt the markets and prevent us from prospering economically again. So it's always this argument or Orwellian claim that it's in all of our common good to immunize the most powerful people and not subject them to the rule of law. And, and what that does, the real outcome of what that does is that it signals to the elite class that you are free to break the law with impunity however much you want. We will never prosecute for, for you for it. And what that does is it means that, in essence, they are incentivized to break the law because they know the more they break the law, the more protected they will be. The New York Times broke the story in 2005 about the NSA spy program, won awards for it, but also sat on it for a year until the election was over. This is something that the New York Times does repeatedly. Um, Interestingly, we saw 
in the WikiLeaks controversy, the executive editor, the uh, executive editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller. Um, despite his paper publishing lots of secrets that WikiLeaks had provided it, went around on this campaign to convince people that the New York Times and WikiLeaks were drastically different. And one of the things that Bill Cowher consistently pointed to proudly yeah. is that unlike WikiLeaks, which publishes secrets without <laughs> the permission of the government, the New York Times goes in advance to the U.S. government and says, we intend to publish these secrets and basically allows the government veto power over it um, to say you should not publish the secret because it's too harmful. Of course, it's the Times that retains the decision ultimately about whether to do it. Sometimes, in, in rare cases, they'll publish it anywhere, but by and large, they obey the orders of the government. Ready Bill to Keller protect national about security. That. Exactly. Yeah. And, and to, what happened was when the New York Times was about to publish the NSA story in 2004, the Bush administration, George Bush himself, summoned um, the publisher of the New York Times and the then executive editor to the Oval Office and said, if you publish this information, you're going to harm national security and render us vulnerable to terrorist attack. It was absurd from the start, that claim, because the only thing the Times was publishing, everybody knew already that the U.S. was eavesdropping on, on terrorists. The only thing the story revealed was that they were doing it without warrants as the law required. They were doing it illegally rather than legally. It's not information that could possibly have helped anybody um, attack the United States, but they obeyed the orders essentially from the Bush White House um, and, as you said, sat on the story for almost a full year until after George Bush was safely reelected. They, they aided and abetted and enabled that to go on without the knowledge of the American people for almost a full year. Again, we are in conversation with Glenn Greenwald, award-winning journalist, author of the new book, With Liberty and Justice for Some, How the Law is Used to Destroy Equality and Protect the Powerful. Something you mentioned earlier made me start thinking about something during our conversation. That's the Church Committee. Uh, committee in Congress, I think in the Senate, um, investigated COINTELPRO and just abuses by the FBI, perhaps the CIA, I don't, I, I right. don't know. Yep. Um, there's a film on YouTube out now from Occupy Oakland showing uh, some police officers and then showing them again as protesters, uh, infiltrators. Um, I, I guess I'm asking you to do some conjecture here, but with these Occupy Wall Street movements gaining steam, do you, and what we saw the NSA program, all these other things, what would you expect right now? the authorities to be doing about this well there's no question that they're taking it very seriously um it, it, it is it is not possible just by the nature of how power is exercised to pose a threat to people who wield power and have them sit by quietly and passively and accept it. They're not they, just watching this. Yeah, they use their power to undermine and subvert it. Um, I'll give you a great example. Um, there was a top secret report published by or uh, prepared by the Pentagon in 2008 um, that declared WikiLeaks, which at the time almost nobody in the United right. States knew, um, to be an enemy of the state. That's the term they used. And they plotted ways to destroy WikiLeaks. They talked about exposing their sources to prevent people from having confidence that if they leak, they can do so without detection. They talked about fabricating documents that are fraudulent and submitting them to WikiLeaks in the hopes that they would publish them, which would destroy their credibility and the credibility of future leaks. They talked about disrupting their financial um, pipeline. All things that essentially ended up being done um, were done to WikiLeaks. Ironically, this report got leaked to WikiLeaks, and, which then published and that's how we know about it. Um, but this is what the U.S. government does all the time to any organization, including domestic ones, that they consider threatening. They've infiltrated dissident groups for decades in the United States. Um, they constantly infiltrate Muslim communities um, with agent provocateurs and, 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 and spies and double agents. And peop Many of the plots that the FBI disrupts um, and then proudly announces are plots that the FBI actually created and, <laughs> and introduced oh, in New York. into people's minds. Um, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I mean, many of these plots um, have been ones that a FBI uh, informants, undercover informants, they have come basically... In Pushing for some They type come of in attack. and they persuade. They, they yeah. target some 22 year old kid and, and convince them that it, it'd be worthwhile to do a plot and they give, feed him the money and they feed him the material and they feed him the means. And then right before he's about to carry out the FBI plot, they disrupt their own plot and then announce to the world that they've <laughs> saved us all from their plot. This right. is what the U.S. government is there to do. They're, they, I mean, the, 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 the surveillance industry, the, the national security state, the law enforcement agencies are extremely well funded at a time when everything else is being stripped away. Um, they operate under an extreme 
cloak of secrecy. Um, and this is the stuff that they've been doing forever. So if they weren't infiltrating Occupy, the Occupy movement and putting in agent provocateurs and trying to undermine the credibility and disrupt them in all sorts of ways, it would be the first time ever, right? It would yeah. be the first time ever. Yeah, I mean, they've so, infiltrated grandmother peace groups. Absolutely. And they use the Patriot Act to spy on environmental groups and anti-war groups, um, civil liberties organizations, and, 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 and pretty much everyone else who's at all dissents from mainstream orthodoxy. Last week we marked the 10-year anniversary of the Patriot Act. Yes, we did. Yeah. That is still going stronger than ever. Yeah. Glenn Greenwald, as we move to wrap up, Again, in 2010, you won the uh, the Online Journalism Association Award for your work about Bradley Manning. Uh, at Occupy San Francisco, there's a debate. I don't know if their General Assembly has voted on this or not, but to rename Justin Herman Plaza uh, to either Scott Olson, uh, who was the Marine who got right. struck last week in Oakland, or after Bradley Manning. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to think about Bradley Manning, WikiLeaks, in Oakland, even the Oscar Grant incident, all of this coming into one big narrative. Well, you know, one of the the things that I think you see that is a common thread through all of this, I mean, when I first wrote about Bradley Manning and the extremely inhumane and oppressive conditions under which he was being detained for 10 months, the question that a lot of people had and that I actually had as well was, well, why would the Obama administration want to basically torture Bradley Manning? I mean, what it seems counterproductive. It, it creates sympathy for Manning. It undermines their ability to prosecute him because his statements made in custody become subject to claims of coercion. And ultimately what I realized is the reason why Bradley Manning is subjected to that treatment is the same reason that the Bush administration picked up thousands of people around the world and brought them thousands of miles away to a a Caribbean island and dressed them in orange jumpsuits and shackles and, and tortured people and showed it to the world. It's the same reason why the police, you know, gratuitously and arbitrarily pepper spray protesters and, and shoot them with rubber bullets. It's because it's a way of signaling to people who might challenge their authority or dissent in a meaningful way that you should think twice about doing so. Mm -hmm. That if you're somebody who wants to go march in the street, look at what we've done to these protesters. If you discover that we've committed crimes and want to expose them, look at what we've done to Bradley Manning. And and it's really about using the law coercively as a force to entrench power, which was the exact opposite of what it was intended to be. Glenn Greenwald, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Again, Glenn Greenwald has been our guest, author of the new book, with liberty and justice for some, how the laws used to destroy equality and protect the powerful. And you're listening to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jesrich. The word anarchist is once again being used to describe the people who committed vandalism in downtown Oakland on Wednesday night. Anarchism, however, is not synonymous with chaos, but it's a set of ideas, concepts, and practices. We return to a conversation I conducted a couple of weeks ago about anarchism with two anarchists, Ramsey Kanan, founder of PM Press, and Andre Grubacic, professor of sociology at the San Francisco Art Institute. Okay, these Occupy movements. are Is there elements of anarchy in these? I think it's worth talking about what is anarchy or anarchism. Mm-hmm. I mean, anarchism is a particular set of ideas, of histories, of theories, and of putting those theories into practice and melding those theories as the practice develops. I think anarchy itself is a much misused term. It's typically used by the state and by enemies of anarchism to signify chaos, disorder, the kind of things that the right and the mainstream media are talking, I would guess, about the Occupy movements. Mm-hmm. As I say, anarchism is a particular set of uh, theories and practices. I think uh, some.